Recording by B. G. Oxford. History of the Inquisition of Spain, Volume One, by Henry Charles Lee, Book One: Origin and Establishment, Chapter One: The Castilian Monarchy, Part One. It were difficult to exaggerate the disorder pervading the Castilian kingdoms when the Spanish monarchy found its origin in the union of Isabella of Castile and Ferdinand of Aragon. Many causes had contributed to prolong and intensify the evils of the feudal system and to neutralize such advantages as it possessed. The struggles of the reconquest from the Saracen continued at intervals through 700 years and varied by constant civil broils had bred a race of fierce and turbulent nobles, as eager to attack a neighbor or their sovereign as the Moor. The contemptuous manner in which the Cid is represented in the earliest ballads as treating his king shows what was, in the twelfth century, the feeling of the chivalry of Castile toward its overlord and a chronicler of the period seems rather to glory in the fact that it was always in rebellion against the royal power. So fragile was the feudal bond that a rico ome, or noble, could at any moment renounce allegiance by a simple message sent to the king through an hidalgo. The necessity of attracting population and organizing conquered frontiers, which subsequently became inland, led to granting improvidently liberal franchises to settlers, which weakened the powers of the crown, without building up, as in France, a powerful third estate to serve as a counterpoise to the nobles and eventually to undermine feudalism. In Spain, the business of the Castilian was war. The arts of peace were left with disdain to the Jews and the conquered Muslims, known as mudejares who were allowed to remain on Christian soil and to form a distinct element in the population. No flourishing centers of industrious and independent burghers arose out of whom the kings could mold a body that should lend them efficient support in their struggles with their powerful vassals. The attempt indeed was made. The Cortes, whose cooperation was required in the enactment of laws, consisted of representatives from seventeen cities, who, while serving, enjoyed personal inviolability. But so little did the cities prize this privilege, that under Henry the Fourth, they complained of the expense of sending deputies. The crown, eager to find some new sources of influence, agreed to pay them, and thus obtained an excuse for controlling their election. And although this came too late for Henry, to benefit by it, it paved the way for the assumption of absolute domination by Ferdinand and Isabella, after which the revolt of the Comunidades proved fruitless. Meanwhile, their influence diminished, their meetings were scantily attended, and they became little more than an instrument which, in the interminable strife that cursed the land, was used alternately by any faction as opportunity offered. The crown itself had contributed greatly to its own abasement. When, in the 13th century, a ruler such as San Fernando III made the laws respected and vigorously extended the boundaries of Christianity, Castile gave promise of development in power and culture, which miserably failed in the performance. In 1282, the rebellion of Sancho el Bravo against his father Alfonso was the commencement of decadence. To purchase the allegiance of the nobles, he granted them all that they asked, and to avert the discontent consequent on taxation, he supplied his treasury by alienating the crown lands. Notwithstanding the abilities of the regent, Maria de Molina, the successive minorities of her son and grandson, Fernando IV and Alfonso XI, stimulated the downward progress although the vigor of the latter in his maturity restored in some degree the luster of the crown and his stern justice re-established order, so that, as we are told, property could be left unguarded in the streets at night. His son, Don Pedro, earned the epithet of the cruel by his ruthless endeavor 
to reduce to obedience his turbulent nobles, whose disaffection invited the usurpation of his bastard brother, Henry of Trastamara. The throne which the latter won by fratricide and the aid of the foreigner, he could only hold by fresh concessions to his magnates, which fatally reduced the royal power. This heritage he left to his son, Juan I, who forcibly described in the Cortes of Valladolid in 1385 how he wore mourning in his heart because of his powerlessness to administer justice and to govern as he ought, in consequence of the evil customs which he was unable to correct. This depicts the condition of the monarchy during the century intervening between the murder of Pedro and the accession of Isabella a dreary period of endless revolt and civil strife, during which the central authority was steadily growing less able to curb the lawless elements tending to eventual anarchy. The king was little more than a puppet, of which rival factions sought to gain possession in order to cover their ambitions with a cloak of legality, and those which failed to secure his person treated his authority with contempt, or set up some rival in a son or brother as an excuse for rebellion. The work of the reconquest, which for 600 years had been the leading object of national pride, was virtually abandoned, save in some spasmodic enterprise, such as the capture of Antequera and the little kingdom of Granada, apparently on the point of extinction under Alfonso XI, seemed destined to perpetuate forever on Spanish soil the hateful presence of the Crescent. The long reign of the feeble Juan II, from 1406 to 1454, was followed by that of the feebler Henry IV, popularly known as El Impotente. In the Seguro de Tordesillas, in 1439, the disaffected nobles virtually dictated terms to Juan II. In the disposition of Avila, in 1465, they treated Henry IV with the bitterest contempt, his effigy, clad in mourning and adorned with the royal insignia, was placed upon a throne, and four articles of accusation were read. For the first, he was pronounced unworthy of the kingly station, when Alonso Carrillo, Archbishop of Toledo, removed the crown. For the second, he was deprived of the administration of justice, when Alvara de Zuniega, Count of Placencia, took away the sword. For the third, he was deprived of the government, when Rodrigo Pimentel, Count of Benevente, struck the scepter away. For the fourth, he was sentenced to lose the throne, when Diego Lopez de Zuniega tumbled the image from its seat with an indecent jibe. It was scarce more than a continuation of the mockery when they elected as his successor his brother Alfonso, a child of eleven years of age. The lawless independence of the nobles and the effacement of royal authority may be estimated from a single example. At Placencia, two powerful lords, Garci Alvarez de Toledo, Senor of Oropesa, and Hernán Rodríguez de Monroy, kept the country in an uproar with their armed dissension. Juan II sent Ayala, Senor of Cebola, with a royal commission to suppress the disorder. Monroy, in place of submitting, insulted Ayala, who as a buen caballero disdained to complain to the king and preferred to avenge himself. Juan, on hearing of this, summoned to his presence Monroy, who collected all his friends and retainers and set out with a formidable army. Ayala made a similar levy and set upon him as he passed near Cebola. There was a desperate battle in which Ayala was worsted and forced to take refuge in Cebola, while Monroy passed on to Toledo and, when he kissed the king's hands, Juan told him that he had sent for him to cut off his head, but as Ayala had preferred to right himself, he gave Monroy a godspeed on his journey home and washed his hands of the whole affair. The Rico Omes, who thus were released from all the restraint of law, had as little respect for those of honor and morality. The virtues which we are wont to ascribe to chivalry were represented by such follies as the celebrated Paso Honroso 
of Suero de Quinones, when that knight and his nine comrades, in 1434, kept, in honor of their ladies, for thirty days against all comers, the pass of the bridge of Orbigo, at the season of the Feast of Santiago, and sixty-nine challengers presented themselves in the lists. With exceptions such as this, and a rare manifestation of magnanimity, as when the Duke of Medina Sidonia raised an army and hastened to the relief of his enemy, Rodrigo Ponce de Leon besieged in Alhama. The record of this time is one of the foulest treachery, from which truth and honor are absent, and human nature displays itself in its basest aspect. According to contemporary belief, Ferdinand was indebted for the crown of Aragon to the poisoning of his brother, the deeply mourned Carlos, Prince of Viana, while the crown of Castile fell to Isabella through the similar taking off of her brother Alfonso. A characteristic incident is one involving Doña Maria de Monroy, who married into the great house of Enriquez of Seville, and was left a widow with two boys. When the youths were respectively eighteen and nineteen years old, they were close friends of two gentlemen of Seville named Manzano. The younger brother, dicing with them in their house, was involved in a quarrel with them, when they set upon him with their servants and slew him. Then, fearing the vengeance of the elder brother, they sent him a friendly message to come and play with them. When he came, they led him along a dark corridor, in which they suddenly turned upon him and stabbed him to death. When the disfigured corpses of her boys were brought to Doña Maria, she shed no tears, but the fierceness of her eyes frightened all who looked upon her. The Manzanos promptly took horse and fled to Portugal, whither Doña Maria followed them in male attire with a band of twenty cavaliers. Her spies were speedily on the track of the fugitives. Within a month of the murders, she came at night to the house where they lay concealed. The doors were broken in, and she entered with ten of her men, while the rest kept guard outside. The Manzanos put themselves in defense and shouted for help, but before the neighbors could assemble, she had both their heads in her left hand and was galloping off with her troop, never stopping till she reached Salamanca, where she went to the church and laid the bloody heads on the tomb of her boys. Thenceforth, she was known as Doña Maria la Brava, and her exploit led to long and murderous feuds between the Monroyes and the Manzanos. Doña Maria was but a type of the unsexed woman, mujeres varoniles, common at the time, who would take the field or maintain their place in factious intrigue with as much ferocity and pertinacity as men. Ferdinand could well look without surprise on the activity in court and camp of his Queen Isabella, when he remembered the prowess of his mother, Juana Enriquez, who had secured for him the crown of Aragon. Doña Leonora Pimentel, Duchess of Arevalo, was one of these. Of the Countess Medellin, it was said that no Roman captain could get the better of her in feats of arms, and the Countess of Haro was equally noted. The Countess of Medellin, indeed, kept her own son in prison for years while she enjoyed the revenues of his town of Medellin, and when Queen Isabella refused to confirm her possession of the place, she transferred her allegiance to the King of Portugal, to whom she delivered the castle of Merida. At the same time, the Moorish influence, which was so strong in Castile, occasionally led to the opposite extreme. The Duke of Najera kept his daughters in such absolute seclusion that no man, not even his sons, was permitted to enter the apartments reserved for the women, and the reason he alleged that the heart does not covet what the eye does not see was little flattering to either sex. The condition of the common people can readily be imagined in this perpetual strife between warlike, ambitious, and unprincipled nobles, now uniting in factions which involved the whole realm in war, and now contenting themselves with assaults upon their neighbors. The land was desolated. The husbandman scarce could take heart to plant his seed, for the harvest was apt to be garnered with the sword and thrust into castles to provision them against siege. As a writer of the period tells us, 
there was neither law nor justice save that of arms. In a letter describing the universal anarchy written by Hernando del Pulgar from Madrid in 1473, he says that for more than five years there has been no communication from Murcia, where the family of Fajardo reigned supreme. It is, he says, as foreign a land as Navarre. That the roads were unsafe for trade or travel was a matter of course. Every petty Hidalgo converted his stronghold into a den of robbers, and what these left was swept away by bands of free companions. Disorder reigned supreme and all-pervading. The crown was powerless and the royal treasury exhausted. Improvident grants of lands and revenues and jurisdictions to bribe the treacherous fidelity of faithless nobles or to gratify worthless favorites were made till there was nothing left to give. And then Henry the Fourth bestowed licenses for private mints until there were a hundred and fifty of them at work, flooding the land with base money to the unutterable confusion of the coinage and the impoverishment of the people. The Cortes of Madrid in 1467 and of Osana in 1469 called on Henry to resume his improvident grants, and those of Madrigal in 1476 repeated the urgency to Ferdinand and Isabella, who had been forced to follow his example. To this the sovereigns replied, thanking the Cortes and postponing the matter. They did not feel themselves strong enough until 1480, when at the Cortes of Toledo they resumed 30 million maravedis of revenue, which had been alienated during the Troubles, and this after an investigation which left untouched the gifts to loyal subjects and only withdrew such as had been extorted. Respect for the crown had fallen as low as its revenues. The story told of the Count of Benevente shows how difficult it was, even after the accession of Isabella, for the nobles to recognize that they owed any obedience to the sovereign. He was walking with the queen when a woman came weeping and begging justice, saying that he had had her husband slain in spite of a royal safe conduct. She showed the letter which her husband had carried in his breast, pierced by the blow which had ended his life, when the count jeeringly remarked, a cuirass would have been of more service. Piqued by this, Isabella said, Count, do you then not wish there was no king in Castile? Rather, he said, I wish there were many. And why? Because then I should be one of them. In such a chaos of lawless passion, it is not to be supposed that the church was better than the nobles, who filled its high places with worthless scions of their stocks, or than the lower classes of the laity who sought it in provision for a life of idleness and license. The primate of Castile was the Archbishop of Toledo, who was likewise ex officio Chancellor of the realm, and whose revenues were variously estimated at from eighty to a hundred thousand ducats, with patronage at his disposal amounting to a hundred thousand more. The occupant of this exalted position at the accession of Isabella was Alonso Carrillo, a turbulent prelate, delighting in war foremost in all the civil broils of the period, who, not content with the immense income of his see, lavished extravagant sums in alchemy. Hernando de Pulgar, in a letter of remonstrance, said to him, The people look to you as their bishop, and find in you their enemy. They groan and complain that you use your authority not for their benefit and reformation, but for their destruction, not as an exemplar of kindness and peace, but for corruption, scandal, and disturbance. When, in 1495, the Puritan Jimenez was appointed to the archbishopric, one of his first acts is said to have been the removal, from near the altar of the Franciscan Church of Toledo, of a magnificent tomb which Carrillo had erected to his bastard, Troilo Carrillo. His successor in the See of Toledo has a special interest for us in view of his labors to purify the faith which culminated in establishing the Inquisition. Pero González de Mendoza was one of the notable men of the day, whose influence with Ferdinand and Isabella won for him the name of the Third King. While yet a child, he held the curacy of Gita. At twelve, 
he had the archdeaconry of guadalajara one of the richest benefices in spain which he retained during the successive bishoprics of calahora and seguenza and the archbishopric of seville the see of seguenza he kept during the whole tenure successively of the archiepiscopates of seville and toledo in addition to which he was a cardinal and titular patriarch of alexandria with his kindred of the powerful house of mendoza he adhered to henry the fourth until they effected the sale of the hapless beltraneja who was in their hands to her father henry for certain estates and the title of duke del infantado for diego hurtado the head of the family after which pero gonzalez and his kinsmen promptly transferred their allegiance to isabella his admiring biographer assures us that he was more ready with his hands than with his tongue that he was a gallant knight and that there was never a war in spain during his time in which he did not personally take part or at least have his troops engaged though he had no leisure to attend to his spiritual duties he found time to yield to the temptations of the flesh when in fourteen eighty four he led the army of invasion to granada he took with him his bastard rodrigo de mendoza a youth of twenty who was already senor del castil del cid and who in fourteen ninety two was created marquis of senente on the occasion of his marriage amid great rejoicings in the presence of ferdinand and isabella to leonor de cerda daughter and heiress of the duke of medina Celi and niece of ferdinand himself this was not the only evidence of his frailty of which he took no shame for he had another son named juan by a lady of valladolid who was married to doña ana de aragon another niece of ferdinand with such men at the head of the church it is not to be expected that the lower orders of the clergy should be models of decency and morality rendering christianity attractive to jew and moslem alonso carillo the archbishop of toledo can scarce be regarded as a strict disciplinarian but even he felt obliged when holding the council of aranda in fourteen seventy three to endeavor to repress the more flagrant scandals of the clergy as a corrective of their prevailing ignorance it was ordered that in the future none should be ordained who could not speak latin the language of the ritual and the foundation of all instruction theological and otherwise they were forbidden to wear silk or gaily colored garments as their licentiousness rendered them contemptible to the people they were commanded to part with their concubines within two months as their fondness for dicing led to perjuries scandals and homicides they were required thereafter to abstain from it privately as well as publicly as many priests disdained to celebrate mass they were ordered to do so at least four times a year bishops moreover were urged to celebrate at least thrice a year under pain of severe penalties to be determined at the next council the absurdities poured forth in their sermons by wandering priests and friars were to be repressed by requiring examinations prior to issuing licenses to preach and the scandals of the pardon sellers were to be diminished by subjecting them to the bishops the bishops were also urged to make severe examples of offenders in the lower orders of the clergy when delivered to them by the secular courts and not to allow their enormities to enjoy continued immunity the bishops moreover were commanded to make no charge for the conferring of ordinations they were exhorted and all other clerics were required not to lead a dissolute military life or to enter the service of secular lords excepting of the king and princes of the blood all duels were forbidden both laity and clergy were warned that if slain in such encounters they would be refused christian burial that this effort at reform was as might be expected wholly abortive is evidenced from the description of the vices of the ecclesiastical body when ferdinand and isabella subsequently endeavored to correct its more flagrant scandals it was wholly secularized and only to be distinguished from the laity by the sacred functions which rendered its vices more abhorrent by the immunities which fostered and stimulated those vices and by the intolerance which blind to all aberrations of morals proclaimed the stake to be the only fitting punishment for aberration in faith while powerless to reform itself 
it yet had influence enough to educate the people up to its standard of orthodoxy in the ruthless persecution of all whom it pleased to designate as enemies of Christ. Yet in Spain, the immunities and privileges of the Church were less than elsewhere throughout Christendom. The independence, which the secular power in Castile had always manifested toward the Holy See and its disregard of the canon law, are points which will occasionally manifest themselves hereafter, and are worthy of a moment's consideration here. I have elsewhere shown that, alone among the Latin nations, Castile steadily refused to admit the medieval inquisition, and disregarded completely the prescriptions of the Church regarding heresy. In the twelfth century, the popular feeling toward the papacy is voiced in the ballads of the Cid. When a demand for tribute to the Emperor Henry IV is said to be made through the Pope, Ruy Diaz advises King Fernando to send a defiance from both of them to the Pope and all his party, which the monarch accordingly does. So when the Cid accompanies his master to a great council in Rome and kicks over the chair prepared for the King of France, the Pope excommunicates him, whereupon he kneels before the Holy Father and asks for absolution, telling him it will be the worse for him if he does not grant it, which the Pope promptly does, on condition of his being more self-restrained during the remainder of his stay. There is no trace of the veneration for the vicegerent of God, which elsewhere was inculcated as an indispensable religious duty. When such was the popular temper, it is easy to understand that the prohibition to carry money out of the kingdom to the Pope was even more emphatic than in England. The claim to control the patronage of the church, which was so prolific a source of revenue to the curia, met throughout Spain a resistance as sturdy as in England, though the troubled condition of the land interfered with its success. In Catalonia, the Cortes in 1419 adopted a law in which, after alluding to the scandals and irreparable injuries arising from the intrusion of strangers, it was declared that none but natives should hold preferment of any kind, and that all papal letters and bulls contravening this should be resisted in whatever way was necessary. In Castile, the Cortes of 1319 forcibly represented to Juan I the evils resulting from this foisting of strangers on the Spanish church, but his speedy death prevented action. The remonstrance was renewed to the tutors of the young Henry III, who promptly placed an embargo on the revenues of foreign benefice holders and forbade the admission of subsequent appointees. This led to a compromise in 1393 by which the Avignonese Curia secured the recognition of existing incumbents by promising that no more such nominations should be made. The promise made by the Avignonese Antipope was not binding on the Roman Curia, and the quarrel continued. Even if the recipient was a native, there was little ceremony in dealing with papal grants of benefices when occasion prompted as was shown in the affair which first revealed the unbending character of the future Cardinal Jimenez. During his youthful sojourn in Rome, Jimenez procured papal expectative letters, granting him the first preferment that should fall vacant in the Diocese of Toledo. On his return, he made use of these letters to take possession of the Archiprestazgo of Uceda, but it happened that Archbishop Carrillo simultaneously gave it to one of his creatures, and, as Jimenez refused to surrender his rights, he was thrown into a tower in Uceda, a tower he subsequently, when himself Archbishop of Toledo, used as a treasury. As he continued obstinate, Carrillo transferred him to the Pozo de Santorcas, a harsh dungeon used for clerical malefactors, where he lay for six years, resolutely refusing to abandon his claim until released at the intercession of the wife of a nephew of Carrillo. Evidently, the Castilian prelates had slender respect for papal diplomas. About the same time, during the civil war between Henry IV and his brother Alfonso, when Hernando de Luxan, bishop of Seguenza, died, the dean Diego Lopez obtained possession of the castles and the treasure of the sea, joined the party of Alfonso, and 
with the aid of Archbishop Carrillo, caused himself to be elected bishop. Meanwhile, Paul II gave the see to Juan de Maella, cardinal bishop of Zamora, but Diego Lopez refused to obey the bulls and appealed to the future council against the Pope and all his censures. He disregarded an interdict launched against him and was supported by all his clergy. Maella died, and Paul II gave the bishopric to the Bishop of Calahora, requesting Henry IV to place him in possession. So secure did Diego Lopez feel that he rejected a compromise offering him the See of Zamora in exchange, but the possession of Siguenza happened to be of importance in the war. By bribery, a troop of royalist soldiers obtained admittance to the castle and carried off Lopez as a prisoner. It was the same even with so pious a monarch as Ferdinand the Catholic. When, in 1476, the archiepiscopal see of Saragossa became vacant by the death of Juan of Aragon, Ferdinand, with his father, Juan II, asked Sixtus IV to appoint his natural son, Alfonso, a child six years of age. The claim of the papacy to archiepiscopal appointments based on the necessity of the pallium was of ancient date and had become incontestable. In the 13th century, Alfonso X had admitted it in the case of the archbishops, but when Isabella appointed Jimenez to the See of Toledo in 1495, the proceedings showed that the post was considered to be in the gift of the crown and the papal confirmation to be a matter of course. So, in the present case, the request was a mere form, as was seen when Sixtus refused. The defect of birth could be dispensed for, but the youth of Alfonso was an insuperable objection, and Sixtus appointed Ancias Despuch, then Archbishop of Montreal, thinking that the services rendered by him and by his uncle, the master of the order of Montesa, would induce the king to assent. Despuch accepted but Ferdinand at once sequestrated all the revenues of Montreal and the priory of Santa Cristina and ordered him to resign. On his hesitating, Ferdinand threatened to seize all the castles and revenues of the mastership of Montesa, which was effectual, and Sixtus compromised by making the boy perpetual administrator of Saragossa. Isabella, despite her piety, was as firm as her husband in defending the claim of the crown in these matters against the papacy. When, in 1482, the see of Cuenca became vacant and Sixtus IV appointed a Genoese cousin to the position, Ferdinand and his queen energetically represented that only Spaniards should have Spanish bishoprics and that the selection should be made by them. Sixtus retorted that all benefices were in the gift of the pope, and that his power, derived from God, was unlimited, whereupon they ordered home all their subjects resident in the papal court and threatened to take steps for the convocation of a general council. These energetic proceedings brought Sixtus to terms, and he sent to Spain a special nuncio, but Ferdinand and Isabella stood on their dignity and refused even to receive him. Then the Cardinal of Spain, Pero González de Mendoza, intervened, and, on Sixtus withdrawing his pretensions, they allowed themselves to be reconciled. They alleged that whatever might be the papal rights in other countries, in Spain the patronage of all benefices belonged to the crown because they and their predecessors had wrested the land from the infidel. So jealous indeed were they of the papal encroachments that among the subjects which they submitted to the National Synod assembled by them in Seville, June 1478, was how to prevent the residence of papal legates and nuncios, who not only carried off much money from the kingdom, but threatened the royal preeminence, to which the Synod replied that this rested with the sovereigns to do, as their predecessors had done. It is easy thus to understand why, in the organization of the Inquisition, they insisted that all appointments should be made by the throne. In other ways, the much-prized superiority of the canon over secular law was disregarded in Spain. The Cortes and the monarch had never hesitated to legislate on ecclesiastical affairs, and the jurisdiction of the ecclesiastical courts was limited with a jealousy which paid scant respect to canon and decretal. 
Nothing, for instance, was better settled than the spiritual cognizance of all matters respecting testaments. Yet when, in 1270, the authorities of Badajoz complained of the interference of the bishop's court with secular judges in such affairs, proceeding to the excommunication of those who exercised jurisdiction over them, Alfonso X expressed surprise and gave explicit commands that such cases should be decided by the lay courts exclusively. So little respect was felt for the immunity of ecclesiastics from secular law, in defense of which Thomas a Becket had laid down his life, that, as late as 1351, an ordenamento of Pedro the Cruel concedes to them that they shall not be cited before secular judges except in accordance with the law. On the other hand, laymen were jealously protected from the ecclesiastical courts. The crown was declared to be the sole judge of its own jurisdiction, and no appeal from it was allowed. In the exercise of this supreme power, laws were repeatedly enacted providing that a layman who should cite another layman before a spiritual judge not only lost his cause, but incurred a heavy fine and disability for public office. The spiritual judge could not imprison a layman or levy execution on his property and he who attempted it or any other invasion of the royal jurisdiction forfeited his benefices and became a stranger in the kingdom, thus rendering him incapable of preferment. The ecclesiastic who cited a layman before a spiritual judge lost any privileges or graces which he might hold of the crown. The layman who attempted to remove a cause from a lay court to a spiritual one was punished with confiscation of all his property, while any vassal who claimed benefit of clergy and declined the jurisdiction of a royal court forfeited his fief. In reenacting these laws in the Cortes of Toledo in 1480, Ferdinand and Isabella complained of their inobservance and ordered their strict enforcement. No other nation in Christendom dared thus to infringe on the sacred limits of spiritual jurisdiction. Yet even this was not all, for the secular power asserted its right to intervene in matters within the church itself. Elsewhere, the ineradictable vice of priestly concubinage was left to be dealt with by bishops and archdeacons. The guilty priests themselves, even in Castile, were exempt from civil authority, but Ferdinand and Isabella had no hesitation in invading their domiciles, and, by repeated edicts in 1480, 1491, 1502, and 1503, endeavored to cure the evil by fining, scourging, and banishing their partners in sin. It is true, as we have seen above, that these laws were eluded, but there was at least a vigorous attempt to enforce them, for in 1490, the clergy of Gipuzkoa complained that the officers of justice visited their houses to see whether they kept concubines, which of course they denied, and carried off their women to prison, where they were forced to confess themselves concubines, to the great dishonor of the church, whereupon the sovereigns repressed the excessive zeal of their officials and ordered them in future to interfere only when the concubinage was notorious. A yet more significant extension of royal authority was exercised when, in 1490, the people of Lequito, Biscay, complained that, though there were twelve mass priests in the parish church, they all celebrated together and at uncertain times, so that the pious were unable to be present. This was a matter belonging exclusively to the diocesan authority, yet the appeal was made to the crown and the royal council felt no scruple in ordering the priests to celebrate in succession and at reasonable hours, under pain of banishment and forfeiture of temporalities, thus disregarding even the imprescriptible immunities of the priesthood. So slender indeed was the respect paid to these immunities that the council of Aranda in 1473 complained that magistrates of cities and other temporal lords presumed to banish ecclesiastics holding benefices in cathedral churches, and it may well be doubted whether the interdict with which the council threatened to punish this infraction of canon was effective in its suppression. 
One of the most deplorable abuses with which the church afflicted society was the admission into minor orders of crowds of laymen who, without abandoning worldly pursuits, adopted the tonsure in order to enjoy the irresponsibility afforded by the claim acquired to spiritual jurisdiction, whether as criminals or as traitors. The Cortes of Torcedillas in 1401 declared that the greater portion of the Rufianes and malefactors of the kingdom wore the tonsure. When arrested by the secular officials, the spiritual courts demanded them and enforced their claims with excommunication, after which they freely discharged the evildoers. This complaint was re-echoed by almost every subsequent Cortes, with an occasional allusion to the stimulus thus afforded to the evil propensities of those who were really clerics. The kings, in responding to these representations, could only say that they would apply to the Holy Father for relief, but the relief never came. The spirit in which these claims of clerical immunity were advanced as a shield for criminals and the resolute firmness with which they were met by Ferdinand and Isabella are illustrated by an occurrence in 1486 in Trujillo, where a man committed a crime and was arrested by the corregidor. He claimed to wear the tonsure, and as the officials delayed in handing him over to the ecclesiastical court, some clerics who were his kinsmen paraded the streets with a cross and proclaimed that religion was being destroyed. They succeeded thus in arousing a tumult in which the culprit was liberated. The sovereigns were in Galicia, but they forthwith dispatched troops to the scene of disturbance. Severe punishment was inflicted on the participants in the riot, and the clerics who had provoked it were deprived of citizenship and were banished from Spain. Less serious, but still abundantly obnoxious, were the advantages which these tonsured laymen possessed in civil suits by claiming the privilege of ecclesiastical jurisdiction. To meet this was largely the object of the laws in the Ordenanzas Reales, described above, and these were supplemented in 1519 by an edict of Charles V, forbidding Episcopal officials from cognizance of cases where such so-called clerics engaged in trades sought the spiritual courts as a defense against civil suits. A similar abuse by which such clerics in public office evaded responsibility for wrongdoing by pleading their clergy, he remedied by reviving an old law of Juan I, declaring them ineligible to office. Thus the royal power in Spain asserted its authority over the church after a fashion unknown elsewhere. We shall see that, so long as it declined to persecute Moors and Jews, Rome could not compel it to do so. When its policy changed under Isabella, it was inevitable that the machinery of persecution should be under the control not of the church but of the sovereign. We shall also see that when the Inquisition inflicted similar wrongs by the immunities claimed for its own officials and familiars, the sovereigns customarily turned a deaf ear to the complaints of the people. Such was the condition of Castile when the death of the miserable Henry IV, December 12, 1474, cast the responsibility of royalty on his sister Isabella and her husband, Ferdinand of Aragon. The power of the crown was eclipsed, the land was ravaged with interminable war between nobles who were practically independent, the sentiment of loyalty and patriotism seemed extinct, deceit and treachery, false oaths, whatever would serve cupidity and ambition, were universal. Justice was bought and sold, private vengeance was exercised without restraint, there was no security for life and property. The fabric of society seemed about to fall in ruins. To evolve order out of this chaos of passion and lawlessness was a task to test to the uttermost the nerve and capacity of the most resolute and sagacious. To add to the confusion, there was a disputed succession, although in 1468 the oath of fidelity had been taken to Isabella with the assent of Henry IV in the contract of Perales, by which he for the second time acknowledged his reputed daughter, Juana, not to be his. He was popularly believed to be impotent, and when his wife, Juana, sister of Alfonso V of Portugal, bore him a daughter, whom he acknowledged and declared to be his heir, her paternity was maliciously ascribed to Beltran 
de la Cueva, and she was known by the opposite party as La Beltraneja. Though Henry had been forced by his nobles to set aside her claims in favor of his brother Alfonso in the declaration of Cabezon in 1464, and after Alfonso's death in favor of Isabella in 1468, the latter's marriage in 1469 with Ferdinand of Aragon so angered him that he betrothed Juana to Charles, Duke of Guienne, brother of Louis XI of France and made the nobles of his faction swear to acknowledge her. At his death he testified again to her legitimacy, and declared her to be his successor, in a will which long remained hidden, and finally, in 1504, fell under the control of Ferdinand, who ordered it burnt. There was a powerful party pledged to support her rights, and they were aided on the one hand by Afonso of Portugal, and on the other by Louis of France, each eager to profit by dismembering the unhappy land. Some years of war, more cruel and bloody than even the preceding aimless strife, were required to dispose of this formidable opposition, years which tried to the utmost the ability of the young sovereigns and proved to their subjects that at length they had rulers endowed with kingly qualities. The decisive victory of Toro, won by Ferdinand over the Portuguese, March 1, 1476, virtually settled the result, although the final treaty was not signed until 1479. The Beltraneja was given the alternative of marrying within six months Prince Juan, son of Ferdinand and Isabella, then but two years old, or of entering the Order of Santa Clara in a Portuguese house. She chose the latter, but she never ceased to sign herself Yo la Reina, and her pretensions were a frequent source of anxiety. She led a varied life, sometimes treated as a queen with a court around her, and sometimes as a nun in her convent, dying at last in 1531 at the age of 70. Isabella was queen in fact, as well as in name. Under the feudal system, the husband of an heiress was so completely lord of the fief that in the capitulations of Cervera, January 7, 1469, which preceded the marriage, the Castilians carefully guarded the autonomy of their kingdom, and Ferdinand swore to observe the conditions. Yet on the death of Henry IV, he imagined that he could disregard the compact, alleging that the crown of Castile passed to the nearest male descendant, and that through his grandfather, Ferdinand of Antiquera, brother of Henry III, he was the lawful heir. The position was, however, too doubtful and complicated for him to insist on this. A short struggle convinced his consummate prudence that it was wisdom to yield, and Isabella's wifely tact facilitated submission. It was agreed that their two names should appear on all papers, both their heads on all coins, and that there should be a single seal on the arms of Castile and Aragon. Thereafter they acted in concert, which was rarely disturbed. The strong individuality which characterized both conduct to harmony, for neither of them allowed courtiers to gain undue influence. As Pulgar says, the favorite of the king is the queen, the favorite of the queen is the king. Ferdinand, without being a truly great man, was unquestionably the greatest monarch of an age not prolific in greatness, the only contemporary whom he did not wholly eclipse being Henry the Seventh of England. Constant in adversity, not unduly elated in prosperity, there was a steadfast equipoise in his character which more than compensated for any lack of brilliancy. Far-seeing and cautious, he took no decisive step that was not well prepared in advance, but when the time came he could strike promptly and hard. Not naturally cruel, he took no pleasure in human suffering, but he was pitiless when his policy demanded. Dissimulation and deceit are too invariable an ingredient of statecraft for us to censure him severely for the craftiness in which he surpassed his rivals or for the mendacity in which he was an adept. Cold and reserved, he preferred to inspire fear rather than to excite affection, but he was well served, and his insight into character gave him the most useful faculty of a ruler, 
the ability to choose his instruments and to get from them the best work which they were capable of performing, while gratitude for past services never imposed on him any inconvenient obligations. He was popularly accused of avarice, but the empty treasury left at his death showed that acquisitiveness with him had been merely a means to an end. His religious convictions were sincere, and moreover he recognized wisely the invaluable aid which religion could lend to statesmanship at a time when Latin Christianity was dominant without a rival. This was especially the case in the Ten Years' War with Granada, his conduct of which would alone stamp him as a leader of men. The foolhardy defiance of Abu al-Hassan, when in 1478 he haughtily refused to resume payment of the tribute which for centuries had been imposed on Granada, and when in 1481 he broke the existing truce by surprising Zahara, was a fortunate occurrence which Fernando improved to the utmost. The unruly Castilian nobles had been reduced to order, but they chafed under the unaccustomed restraint. By giving their warlike instincts legitimate employment in a holy cause, he was securing internal peace. By leading his armies personally, he was winning the respect of his Castilian subjects, who hated him as an Aragonese, and he was training them to habits of obedience. By making conquests for the crown of Castile, he became naturalized and was no longer a foreigner. It was more than a hundred years since a king of Castile had led his chivalry to victory over the infidel, and national pride and religious enthusiasm were enlisted in winning for him the personal authority necessary for a sovereign, which had been forfeited since the murder of Pedro the Cruel had established the bastard line upon the throne. It was by such means as this, and not by the Inquisition, that he started the movement which converted feudal Spain into an absolute monarchy. His life's work was seen in the success with which, against heavy odds, he lifted Spain from her obscurity in Europe to the foremost rank of Christian powers. Yet amid the numerous acts of cruelty and duplicity which tarnished the memory of Ferdinand as a statesman, examination of his correspondence with his officials of the Inquisition, especially with those employed in the odious business of confiscating property of the unhappy victims, has revealed to me an unexpectedly favorable aspect of his character. While urging them to diligence and thoroughness, his instructions are invariably to decide all cases with rectitude and justice, and to give no one cause of complaint. While insisting on the subordination of the people and the secular officials to the holy office, more than once we find him intervening to check arbitrary action and to correct abuses, and when cases of peculiar hardship arising from confiscations are brought to his notice, he frequently grants to widows and orphans a portion of the forfeited property. All this will come before us more fully hereafter and a single instance will suffice here to illustrate his kindly disposition to his subjects. In a letter of October 20, 1502, he recites that Domingo Munoz of Calataina has appealed to him for relief, representing that his little property was burdened with an annual censal, or ground rent, of two sols, eight dineros, part of a larger one confiscated in the estate of Juan de Buendia condemned for heresy, and he orders Juan Royes, his receiver of confiscations at Saragossa, to release the ground rent and let Munoz have his property unencumbered, giving as a reason that the latter is old and poor. It shows Ferdinand's reputation among his subjects that such an appeal should be ventured, and the very triviality of the matter renders it the more impressive that a monarch whose ceaseless personal activity was devoted to the largest affairs of the tumultuous world, should turn from the complicated treachery of European politics to consider and grant so humble a prayer. In his successful career as a monarch, he was well seconded by his queen. Without deserving the exaggerated encomiums which have idealized her, Isabella was a woman exactly adapted to her environment. As we have seen, the Mujer Varonil was a not uncommon development of the period in Spain, and Isabella's youth passed in the midst of civil broils, with her fate more than once suspended in the balance, had strengthened and hardened the masculine element in her character. 
self-reliant and possessed of both moral and physical courage, she was prompt and decided, bearing with ease responsibilities that would have crushed a weaker nature, and admirably fitted to cope with the fierce and turbulent nobles, who respected neither her station nor her sex, and could be reduced to obedience only by a will superior to their own. She had the defects of her qualities. She could not have been the queen she was without sacrifice of womanly softness, and she earned the reputation of being hard and unforgiving. She could not be merciful when her task was to reduce to order the wild turmoil and lawlessness which had so long reigned unchecked in Castile, but in this she shed no blood wantonly, and she knew how to pardon when policy dictated mercy. How she won the affection of those in whom she confided can be readily understood from the feminine grace of her letters to her confessor, Hernando of Talavera. A less praiseworthy attribute of her sex was her fondness for personal adornment, in which she indulged in spite of a chronically empty treasury, and a people overwhelmed with taxation. We hear of her magnifying her self-abnegation in receiving the French ambassador twice in the same gown, while an attaché of the English envoy says that he never saw her twice in the same attire, and that a single toilette with its jewels and appendages must have cost at least 200,000 crowns. She was, moreover, rigidly tenacious of royal dignity. Once when Ferdinand was playing cards with some grandees, the Admiral of Castile, whose sister was Ferdinand's mother, addressed him repeatedly as nephew. Isabella was undressed in an inner room and heard it. She hastily gathered a garment around her, put her head through the door, and rebuked him. Hold, my lord, the king has no kindred or friends. He has servants and vassals. She was deeply and sincerely religious, placing almost unbounded confidence in her spiritual directors, whom she selected not among courtly casuists to soothe her conscience, but from among the most rigid and unbending churchmen within her reach, and to this may in part be attributed the fanaticism which led her to make such havoc among her people. She was scrupulously regular in all church observances, in addition to frequent prayers, she daily recited the hours like a priest, and her biographer tells us that, in spite of the pressing cares of state, she seemed to lead a contemplative rather than an active life. She was naturally just and upright, though in the torturous policy of the time she had no hesitation in becoming the accomplice of Ferdinand's frequent duplicity and treachery. With all the crowded activity of her eventful life, she found time to stimulate the culture despised by the warlike chivalry around her, and she took a deep interest in an academy which, at her insistence, was opened for the young nobles of her court by the learned Italian Peter Martyr of Anghiera. End of Book One, Chapter One